My guest today is Nicholas Stern. Nick is a professor of economics at the LSE. Formerly, he was vice president of the World Bank and second permanent secretary to the English Treasury. His research focuses on international climate policies. He headed the Stern Review, an extremely influential analysis of the economics of climate change and what we needed to do to avoid global warming. Welcome, uh, Nick Stern. It's really fantastic to have you here. It's a it's really a, a, a privilege to be able to talk to you about all the big challenges that, that the world and Europe is facing. And, uh, and thanks, thanks for your time. It's a pleasure, Luis. Okay, so, so I wanted to, um, to, uh, to start with, with, with uh, something that, that really, uh, it's rare that economists write a piece of paper that actually changes the world. But I think the Stern report that you did 15 years ago has, has a real claim. To having to having shaped uh, history in, in many ways, uh, do you think if you look back from from where you were then, would you have been uh, disappointed where we are now? Do you think we're making good progress? Do you think the world heard the message about the urgency of what we were confronting? What what's your what's your in retrospect? What would your next self of 15 years ago have saw, have thought? Well, I think an assessment of the last 15 years has to be mixed. Um, we have not shown the urgency of action that we should have shown. Um, emissions are still rising around the world. They're close to a plateau now, but they're still, still rising. So in terms of the simple practicality of cutting emissions, bringing them to a peak, turning them downwards, uh, we've moved too slowly. And that has uh, increased the danger that we're in. You know, we're already over one degree centigrade uh, higher uh, than uh, in average global surface temperature relative to the benchmark at the end of the 19th uh, century. And we're seeing the signs of that. But there's some positives, Louise. I mean, there are some positives, um, particularly in recent years. But we've seen extraordinary movement in technology. And we've seen in the last couple of years a clear commitment in countries around the world to the net zero target by 2050. And that net zero target is extremely important. And we've seen more and more countries recognizing that that drive to decarbonize, that drive to net zero is the growth story of the 21st century. And it's pretty attractive, cleaner, more efficient, more inclusive cities where you can move and breathe and ecosystems which are robust and fruitful. So basically movement too slow, but a pickup in countries, private sector in the last two or three uh, years, the EU especially, and uh, a recognition that this is actually a very attractive, different, different path of development and growth. So, so this, this uh, positive vision you're presenting of inclusive green growth is, is beautiful. And let me postpone it by, by, one, by, by one question to ask you first about uh, China. We, we saw it, what Adam Tooze in this show considered a, a huge announcement by China in the, in the fourth quarter. Uh, do you see China really ready to, to, to change its ways and to, and to become part of the solution rather than a part of the problem? Yes, I do. I've been working in China and lived a, one longish period in China. I've been working there for 30 years. And the last uh, four or five years on climate in China has seen a very big change. And I absolutely agree that the announcement uh, in September last year by President Xi Jinping uh, at the United Nations uh, uh, in September, um, that they would go to carbon, what he called carbon neutrality by 2060 was extremely important. And um, it signals a recognition in China that has been building for quite some time. They are extremely vulnerable to uh, climate change. Uh, they're so dependent, for example, from the waters of the Himalayas. So much of the population on the, uh, on the East Coast, vulnerable to sea level rise and uh, uh, cyclones and so on. So the vulnerability means that the commitment is considered and clear. The pollution that they saw in their cities was also a strong motivation to do things differently. 
and actually they see that this involves quite a lot of new technology that they're probably going to be rather good at. So for all these reasons, I think that China's commitment is considered and serious. At the same time, as in most countries, there's politics and vested interests. Um, it's not always so visible in China, but every country has politics and vested interests, and so do they. So there are some people who push back, some people you know, who, are, who are really dependent on the coal industry, who do not want to see coal uh, production and use uh, run down quickly, as it must be. So they push back. Uh, there are those who say, we've just had this crisis of COVID, that uh, there has been you know, unemployment or slower growth than we're used to in China. Let's just get back by using what we know. We're in much better growth story is to invest in the future and the different technologies, which China's becoming rather, rather good at. So those tensions are there, but I do think that China's commitment is real because it's founded in good arguments, good arguments which have been aired and heard and discussed, but there's still internal battles going on and coal is not yet turning down. So, so let me go to this positive um, growth inclusive green that you were, you were hinting at before. Um, for, for many people, when they see Europe and, and other places, but particularly Europe, significantly raise the standards all the time and, 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 and aim higher on climate, people are scared, particularly for jobs. We saw the backlash uh, that Macron faced when he pushed uh, carbon pricing. Um, People are scared that they think, okay, what happens with my car industry? For example, if you're Germany or Spain that has a massive car industry, we don't have expertise in electrical cars. We don't have uh, expertise in batteries. We're going to get destroyed. There are many less parts that are needed for electric cars. So, so there is a fear, that there's this, this trade-off that if we are going to push this green agenda, it's going to cost us in terms of growth and jobs. You seem to be much more optimistic about that. Give us, give us that, that positive vision. If, if, yeah. if that, what? I'm very optimistic about what we can do. I worry very much about what we will do, because whilst the gains are potentially very large, it does need radical change. And uh, that can be badly done or well done. So we as economists have to think through what it means uh, to make these investments, how they can be incentivized, and how the change can be managed, because radical change is exactly that. It's radical change. It involves dislocation, and you have to uh, manage that. But the first thing is to recognize where we need to go and how it can be really uh, attractive and to see what's involved in doing that, because that's what we're trying to do. So we have to think it through. Already, many parts of the activities that are relevant here are cheaper using the zero carbon methods, even without a carbon price, even without subsidy, because of the vision of the past and the investments and innovations have been made of the past, even on the back of rather ordinary, perhaps even mediocre policies, still that sense of direction has prompted innovation. So big parts of the, most of the electricity supply industry is now cheaper uh, to do in a uh, renewable way taking into account the cost of storage and grid management and, uh, and, and so on. So the first thing is the vision of where we need to go and to go on driving down those costs across the board. We've seen it in electricity supply, it's continuing there. Electric vehicles are basically much more efficient. You already said they've got less parts. Well, good, that's a more efficient product and they throw away, they don't have radiators which throw away the heat. You know, it's a, the internal combustion engine is fundamentally an inefficient way of doing things an electric vehicle and it doesn't take so long to make an electric vehicle but at the same time change is crucial and management of that change is crucial so a big part of the story is not simply the incentives such as carbon pricing and and uh, the ban on the sale of uh, internal combustion engine vehicles it's more than those policies more than the policies of, of you know zero emission zones in cities, all those things which are necessary. But it's more than that. It's managing the dislocation. And I think actually that some countries are starting to do that well. And my friends in, uh, in Spain uh, are very focused, as, as I'm sure 
you know, on this, uh, on this issue. Uh, the European Investment Bank has uh, been making very sensible support in Poland and elsewhere on uh, retraining, because after all, the dislocation is in large measure about investing in people and investing in places. It's also a social safety net, but the more positive story is to invest in people and to invest in the places which, uh, in which more people are dislocated so that uh, there are, can be strong localized effects. So that management of change is absolutely fundamental, but the prize is enormous. I mean, so much of this is just more efficient, uh, cleaner. It's where the innovation frontier is moving, uh, moving very quickly. And of course, the fundamental gains of the reduction of the immense risks of climate change. Mm -hmm. The, the um, COVID pandemic, in a way, uh, it has been a plus and a minus uh, in terms of, 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 well, it has been a completely catastrophic uh, thing for humanity, but it has kind of shown us that, that you know, the, there is a, a cost to not acting together and to not being and not being able to act as 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 a, as a as a world together. You have written about this with Stiglitz and other co-authors. You write that that the climate is a bit like COVID, uh, but climate is more in slow motion. Uh, it's not a very reassuring metaphor. I mean, what have we learned in, from the COVID pandemic in terms of of the public reaction of cooperation uh, for our fight against climate change? I think we've learned that acting strongly and acting together is fundamental. And that those countries that acted strongly and acted uh, strongly as a society working together, uh, like uh, New Zealand and uh, South Korea and uh, uh, Taiwan and so on, are those countries that have handled uh, COVID, uh, COVID better. But I think we also see that the drive out of the terrible recession that we're seeing around the world from COVID can also be a drive towards a, a much better future. Um, simply in Keynesian multiplier terms, to invest strongly now will give us big increases in output. The, the IMF reckons that multipliers around the world are currently around 2.7. So if we invested quickly another couple of percentage points of GDP, we would see GDP bounce back by over five percentage points. Basic short run Keynesian multiplier. If we can sustain that, if we can push up investment in the next decade, the coming decade, by two or three percentage points around the world higher than the last decade, we'll get strong uh, growth and innovation. If you like, there's a Harrod growth story uh, there if we push up investment, but we're doing it at a time <clears throat> when innovation is so important. And if you look at the investments we need to do from the point of view of climate and moving to net zero, you actually get a similar number of you know, a couple of percentage points of GDP. So if we can push up quickly our investment, public and private both, uh, they're complementary in all this. We could have in the 20s, a strong decade of growth in a much more attractive way than we saw in the rather sluggish decade that's just closed and indeed finished with this massive crisis of COVID. On the other hand, it could go the other way. You know, if, if we're too cautious, if we lapse back into austerity too quickly as we did it after 2009, we could miss this opportunity in the next decade. It could be even worse than the point of view of growth and employment and incomes in the last decade. It's a big choices we face. So, so, so the way you, you put it, both, both objectives of growth and environment are, are aligned. Um, let, me, let me push back a little bit on that. So, so Olivia Blanchard and others have said, well, you know, in some sense, uh, Mike Greenstone said, said, talked here about no, no free lunch in some sense, which is, okay, the kind of investments that you might need in order to get strong growth back might not be the greenest investments. And the greenest investments might be not necessarily the ones that you can get going in one, two years uh, to get your economy recovered. So those are not necessarily the same objective. How would you, how would you answer that? Well, I've been talking to Olivier <laughs> about this, actually. Answer in the short run and the medium run. In the short run, uh, we've got real pains in unemployment and we have to act uh, quickly. And what kinds of investments 
are fast in implementation, labor intensive and have strong multipliers. Well, here's some examples, uh, retrofitting buildings, pushing out uh, broadband, making the infrastructure for uh, charging uh, electric vehicles, making our cities more friendly to pedestrians and cyclists. That's physical capital. Look at natural capital, restoring degraded land, for example, in the UK, restoring our peatlands is, uh, is very, uh, is very uh, important. Uh, so, so much reforesting. So much of what we have to do uh, for a much better uh, form of investment in relation to climate can actually satisfy what Keynes would have looked for in terms of the multipliers, fast, mm -hmm. labor intensive and so on. Um, with these strong no benefits, in the medium term, uh, pushing ahead with the new forms of investment is actually pushing ahead where innovation is particularly uh, strong. The fastest innovation in the world is in these areas. And we're also seeing the benefits of increasing returns to scale. A lot of what happened in solar and wind was about scale. So I think that both in the short run, in the Keynesian multiplier story, and in the more medium term, when you're talking about um, the new forms of investment, driving down costs, greater efficiency, I think that uh, the balance of the argument points to the combination of investment and innovation driving growth by exploring the new frontiers. So um, I was it was pretty it was pretty persuasive and uh, and, and and hopeful. What what uh, Nick, what, what about the tools that we have? The other set of tools apart from investment to fight climate change. You've you've talked about carbon pricing as necessarily being part of the solution. Yes. Uh, of course, the problem with carbon pricing, and I was hinting at that before, and you talked a little bit about the, the left behind places. The problem with carbon pricing is that uh, there are big distribution impacts, people who drive a lot, people who drive trucks, people who drive uh, tractors, many people who actually are going to pay an extra price and, and never came as clear to the minds of economists what the political constraints are as when, as when Macron tried to do this in France. Yeah. Um, what are the lessons about how to implement carbon prices uh, in a way that that actually is politically feasible, not just economically sensible? I mean, one thing we must be clear on in economics is that first, this is radical change. And second, when you think about radical change, the challenge of distribution and management should be at centre stage. It's not just set a carbon price and everything turns out efficient. It's much deeper much deeper, more complicated uh, than uh, that. I've already spoken about managing dislocation, investing in people, retraining. But there's also, of course, relative price changes which affect consumers. And it's very important there uh, to use the revenue well with priority for the poorer of the, amongst those groups. Now, on balance, uh, the rich consume more energy than the poor um, by quite a lot. Now, it may go down as a fraction of income, but they still consume more energy than uh, poor people. So there'll be revenue there, uh, which can be redistributed towards the poor people. It should be possible to make virtually uh, everybody at the bottom end uh, better off uh, using the revenue from uh, carbon prices. That should be a strong uh, priority. We also have to remember that poorer people um, don't buy new cars. Uh, at least they buy less new cars than the richer people. So a switch over to electric vehicles will take time to come into the second hand, the used car market. So there are quite a lot of parts of this story where the distributional implications are quite complicated, but they should be front and center of policy. And you shouldn't announce a policy and then fix the distribution side later you should think of the distribution side as you make that policy and do them uh, do them simultaneously. Let me, let me highlight one thing that you mentioned that I think is, is extremely promising and, and, and ask you further about it, which is this idea of, okay, we get some revenue from the carbon pricing, we make it more or less revenue neutral, we use all this revenue to make everybody at the bottom better off uh, so that politically the whole, the whole system holds together. Have you seen anywhere where they're trying to get a system, cashback system like that, that is actually working? It seems like the most promising way to, to get this, this, this key part of the mechanism going. Is this, is this actually 
feasible from a political perspective? Yes, they're, they're cashback systems, for example, in British uh, Columbia. Um, but it's very important to tilt them. Often, that, you know, everybody gets a check. Yeah. Now, you can say that if everybody gets a check as a fraction of income, the poorer people uh, get a higher fraction of their income back as a check, uh, the cash transfer. But I do think it's important to tilt it towards tilt it towards poorer people. And I don't see it's particularly uh, complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, you could even make the, you know, the cash payment for rich people, make it flat, but make it taxable for rich, make it taxable so the poorer people, you know, who are below the tax net or paying tax at a lower rate. Now, there are various ways of tilting the redistribution in favour of, uh, favour of poor people. Mm -hmm. Now, um, apart from, from the carbon price, there is another mechanism that is, that is crucial and, and we have been working in Europe for, uh, I, want, I want your view on how to design it, which is the carbon border adjustment mechanism. The idea that if we have a carbon price in Europe or in other places and other people don't have a carbon price, then there is a risk that production gets moved to the place where, where, where there is no, no uh, carbon pricing mechanism. And so we, the planet is as badly off because the pollution continues, but we lose jobs, we lose production, et cetera. So the solution is to put a carbon price uh, to make sure people from from other places also have to import the same price that people who are producing in Europe. Um, this has proven very, very hard to design. Mike Greenstone told me he was trying with Obama, very hard to design it. They didn't manage, apparently, yeah. for the US. Uh, what's your view on, on what's the way to get this mechanism? Yeah. To well, there, there are a number of aspects. First, theoretically, the argument is correct. Yeah. Second, it's empirical application is very narrow. It's essentially energy intensive trade exposed industries. Um, and the empirical evidence is that there's very little movement of uh, production towards sort of dirty havens, if you want to call them that. Uh, very little evidence of that. Why? Because people choose to have their production where they've got skilled labor force, where the infrastructure functions where the investment climate and the governance is attractive. And, you know, those are the big things that shape where people put activities. So the relevance for moving is very narrow and the empirical evidence is very strong there. But there are some uh, energy uh, intensive trade exposed. Steel is important, uh, aluminium, um, some uh, plastics, you know, petroleum, Product, byproducts from the petroleum industry, cement, some aspects of, of, of wood, you know, wood pulp and so on. There, there are four or five industries where it's, it's important. Cement, less important because it's so heavy, people don't move it around so much. So if you look into the detail, steel comes first. Yeah. So my instincts are given the narrowness of the application, it's sensible to focus. Because if you try to make it totally economy-wide, it gets very complicated. And many countries around the world, very developing countries, will think you're trying to discriminate against them. You know, and actually they might be right. You, know, you can sneak in protectionism into uh, this story. So theoretically correct, empirically narrow, keep it simple and focus first on those places where it really matters. And I think, I would start with steel. All right. So hopefully we will see a system in Europe uh, pretty pretty soon. Um, there is uh, other uh, set of of of, uh, of policies that have been considered for for reaching those those climate goals. Uh, these could include uh, public transportation, uh, renewable based power generation. You've talked about some of these policies. Yeah. Um, which are the main the, if you had to choose three that you would say, look, this is low-hanging fruit, you need to do that. To all these governments that now have recovery money in Europe, where should they really, really prioritize? The policies or the investment? Yes. Both, the, both. the investments uh, from the European money, sorry. Where, where should they invest the European money? Which, which would be the key, the key areas that you would think are, are the ones with the highest returns? Uh, if, if you look at the really big emitters, uh, energy, transport, agriculture, and I would focus 
on those three. Uh, transport, of course, uh, public transport, energy, strong move to renewables, where we look very carefully at grid management and storage. We need European cooperation in grid. The center of Spain, where land is very cheap and the sun is very strong, uh, it should be uh, very strong on solar. And we know we can transport that with you know, high voltage uh, direct DC cables over quite long distances, quite cheaply. But that needs European cooperation in transmission and distribution, European cooperation around smoothing out renewables. The bigger area you smooth it out over, the easier it is to smooth it out. So transport with public transport and electric uh, vehicles, increasing the autonomous vehicles, the design of cities, that's, a, that's one bag, yeah? The energy system is uh, another bag. Energy efficiency, extremely important uh, in buildings and uh, agriculture. Agriculture around the world has subsidies of around 600, 700 billion dollars, depending how you do the sums, very large. And what do you get? You get degraded land, you get poisoned uh, waterways and rivers, and uh, you get cut down forests. Now, those impact in different ways in different countries around the world. But Europe has its share of that. And it's not that I would reduce the agricultural subsidies, I would make them different. I, public money for public goods. And we could have a much better, actually more productive agriculture and much less degrading of the environment. And incidentally, you could orient it towards uh, away from the very rich farming enterprise towards the smaller farmers. So there's so much that could be done. But if you're looking at big reductions, look at the big areas. And those are the ones I've tried to uh, describe. So one, one thing I worry about, again, you've, you've been in government, you've been in private sector, you've, you've seen the, the world from, from, the, from, the, from the ivory tower as well as an economist. Uh, one thing I worry about is we, we're giving enormous amounts of sums to be invested by governments and, and is the governance of all these mechanisms what worries me how governments that haven't been able to publish accurate figures of how many people are sick or or dead in their countries how are they going to be managing this this massive process we're putting in front of them uh how does all of this alter the, the balance between the government and the, and, and, the, and the market and how do we make sure that that these resources are employed efficiently and not a source of chronic capitalism, money for friends and family, etc. I think um, to look for as much as possible at the investment from the private sector. If you look at the automobile, the car industry, uh, by saying, you know, as we've done in the UK, uh, you can't sell the internal combustion engine car uh, after 2030. That is something which is a very clear, powerful signal to the private producers of cars. And they've responded very well, actually. They've said, thanks, that's clear. We're on the way. We're going to invest. But that's private sector investment with a public uh, signal. Some aspects of public transport are going to have to be in the public uh, sector. And there, clear, clear plans, transparently, close scrutiny, buy in the best possible management. And management does make a difference. We've seen that on the London Underground. You know, it really can transform if you get the very best management with private sector uh, experience with, of course, transparency being very important. And the third thing I would underline is the role of development banks. I had the privilege to be six years as chief economist at the EBRD, where we invested in both the public and the private uh, sector and in combinations. And every Friday morning for six years, I sat on the loan committee and we scrutinized against the criteria of sound banking, good risk return, additionality, that this bank was going to partner with private sector where private sector couldn't necessarily go by uh, itself because of risk management uh, issues. And it had to have the right kind of impact. Now in the case of EBRD, it was moving the transition forward in those countries of Central Europe and former. Soviet Union, Central Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Here it would be, you know, objectives around 
leveling up across Europe, particularly, of course, moving to uh, zero, zero carbon. So I think the mechanism of the investment bank, that has to be transparent and accountable too, of course, that can help with this kind of issues. So those decisions are not buried inside a ministry. They are taken within a public organization with a clear mandate and principles and it's accountable. I hope that's I hope that's feasible. There is another governance you issue. You can't take it away, Luis, but you can <laughs> you can act to reduce. You can get it better. The, the, um, there is another governance issue that I want to raise with you, which has to do with the role of, of central banks in all of this. There's been a big discussion uh, lately uh, between economists on one side and the other in the debate, uh, Cochrane, for example, on one side, uh, Isabel Schnabel from the ECB on the other, on whether the ECB and other central banks should be involved in fighting uh, climate change. Uh, some economists say, look, uh, this is not in your mandate. John Cochrane has said this. Uh, this requires a political mandate. You're going too far. You're straying into, 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 into areas where there's not necessarily a backing, democratic backing. Others have said, look, um, you're from a prudential angle. You need to be watching for the risks that come from all angles. Second, you need to, you need to uh, uh, support the general policies of the European Union. So that means climate. Um, how is this risk reward uh, equation in your mind? Should central banks be taking an active, really determining role in this direction? Uh, yes, the um, I think central banking uh, should be about uh, stability and growth. Now, the first thing we think about central banks is price stability, and uh, that's as it uh, should be. But we know that they do have to think about stability of the financial system. And we actually know they have to think about the stability of the economy. They do worry about unemployment and they should worry about unemployment. And it's the skill of good central banking to think through how they manage price stability. That's the first one, but they know it's not the only one. There's financial stability and there's unemployment and growth as well. So what we're talking about here when we're talking about uh, climate, we're talking about in important ways, financial uh, stability, because this is a process of change where capital asset values are likely to change very quickly, where relative prices are going to uh, change quite quickly. And that will affect the stability of financial uh, in institutions. There are also the physical risks, which the insurance companies are very much concerned with, and uh, they are very big players, of course. And uh, increasingly, there are going to be litigation risks as well. And that's playing itself through in quite interesting ways in di different parts of Europe, actually, in different parts of the world. So financial stability and risk to the financial system must be something that central banks worry about. But I also think the story of growth and unemployment uh, is fundamental. I mean, banks, the central bank is there to facilitate, in some broad sense, the functioning of the economy from the point of view of particularly the role of financial institutions in the functioning of that uh, economy. What is so important about the functioning of the economy in the coming 10 years and beyond? But, certainly, but let's just talk about the country. It is changing very quickly to much more sustainable forms of investment and increasing investment quickly. So I think central banks, when they think about their role, instability and unemployment and growth, always putting price stability first, have to think of this issue. And even simply as a facilitator, you could put it more strongly, but even simply as a facilitator or accommodating this kind of change, then I think they do have a role to play. It should be driven by the finance ministries, by the economics ministries, but do central banks have to take this into account? And can they be helpful? Yes, they should, and they can be helpful. So I, I can't I can't let you go uh, as as a, as a person so involved in in, in British uh, policy and political life without asking you about Brexit, of course. Um, we 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 had very recently uh, the news that the UK is not wanting to recognise the, the the European ambassador as an ambassador. They wanted just to be some international organisation with not a representative rank, and it has it is a kind of a nugget for. For the risk of, of, of the future, right? Which is that we start growing apart, that the UK, Europe, uh, 
uh, see themselves increasingly as rivals and not as partners, and that this, that this relation just deteriorates badly. And, and there are many ways that this could happen through Northern Ireland, through financial services, many, many things. Um, how do you feel about this, this process and, and how should we manage it, if you have any advice? Um, I was strongly and publicly against Brexit. I thought it was a very bad idea. I think it's a very bad idea. But here we are, you know, it's happened. So we have to look forward. So the challenge now is how can the UK and Europe work together? It's one thing to say, be nice to each other. And we should, yeah, we should be. But I think these things, the, uh, the, the friendships, the ties are deepened by collaboration and working together. And I think climate is one such issue where the UK and Europe are very much on the same page. There's so much they could do together. They're centers of thought about policy. Um, they're centers of thoughts, uh, uh, of creativity around technology and uh, universities and research institutes. Um, they should be places where the challenge of how to manage change is one which should be explored together and we learn from each other. So whilst I regret what happened, I think working together on common uh, challenges is arguably the best way to bring ourselves together. Uh, on the particular point about the treatment of the EU ambassador uh, to the UK, I, I think just think it's absurd. We should treat the EU ambassador as every other country in the world does, like an ambassador, right? And uh, when, the U, U, when the UK was in the EU, it benefited from, uh, from that. So I hope that uh, is seen as, uh, as they used to say in earlier days, a little local skirmish. Yes. And I, <laughs> I hope it's resolved in a sensible direction, which means... Yes, I, I really do hope that is, yeah. Yeah. I really do hope that it's not uh, something about, about what is to come. And, and, uh, and, it's, and petty. I, I, it's petty, it shouldn't have happened. Yeah, it shouldn't happen. All right, uh, thanks very much. We, we had a great chat, we, we learned a lot. And I think in a year where it was hard to, to be optimistic about many things, uh, I really thank you for, for giving uh, the viewers an, an optimistic uh, view of, of, of how an inclusive, greener uh, future uh, can look. So I think that's, that's, a, that's appreciated. Oh, thank you, Louis. I, just to underline, I'm optimistic about what we can do. I often worry about whether we will or whether we yes. will do it well enough. But that's our job, right? We've got to discuss how to do that. Yes, and we, we have to, indeed, we have to, to set up that vision that, of what can happen and, and try to, to push the debate in that direction. So I think that, that, uh, that you did a good effort at that today. So thank you very much. <laughs> good to see you. Bye-bye. Okay.